Hello, ladies and gents, and welcome to our chess meeting. Uh, we'll be discussing the importance of dominating, controlling the open files in the middle game. Very important, right? This is a uh, very useful stuff because that's how you actually control and restrict your opponent's access. And you also getting, you know, gaining points of access into their defenses. So easier than for you to win. So let's look at the practicality of the situations here. So we're talking about the middle game. Okay, you can see there is already a tension on the C file, right? So rooks are hitting one another. There will be absolutely no point for white now to start trading. Rook takes rook, then the black rook takes, then you get a rook, and rook takes and queen takes. It's just simply not strong enough. It's just that's not how we do it. There is one little subtlety. First thing first, you got to look at all your resources and understand their purpose. But now there is one subtlety, one nuance, which we will be uh, enacting on now. We've got a bishop to h3. This is a very good one because hits the c8 square directly attacking the rook. Now rook either moves away, which is what we wanted in the first place. So this is how you dominate on the C file. And now, even if the black rook takes you, you're going to take it back. But now they can't get the rook to make an opposition to your rook. They can't counteract your rook with their rook because you got a bishop on h3. So this is a very direct, simple example of how you take control over an open file. Very important because now the C file belongs to you. Okay, Let's move to the next position now. Okay, this is from a famous game. It happened in 1930 in between Alexander Alakine, the former world uh, champion, and Aaron Nimzovich. Okay, so these guys were very strong, very uh, uh, powerful players in that era, the beginning of the 20th century. And now we are going to look at something called the Alakine's gun. So that's coming exactly from his way to interpret this kind of position. You're already noticing... Uh, it's just that we've got a pin here. We're making a pin. The knight on c6 can't really move because the bishop takes the queen. So that's one thing you need to keep in mind. Secondly, we've already gotten a very, very strong battery here. Two rooks already aiming down the board or up the board. Depends how you want. Yes. Uh, now, there is a subtlety here. And Alakine understood that if you want to increase the power either on adding pressure on the pin piece, which is the knight on c6, or increasing the attacking power on the c file, he needs to do a slight readjustment. Rook to c3, just watch it. Queen, I mean, it's not too many options for black. Probably you've noticed. It's really not too many options. So queen to d7, rook to c2. And maybe now it's become even more obvious because after rook c2, you notice how the y queen can actually become itself very active, very powerful, going behind the rooks. You you wouldn't want to get the rook, uh, sorry, the queen in front of the rooks, because really you can't start making trades here with the queen being exposed to possible rooks uh, attacks. So you move the rooks, given the fact that black does not have too many options. So really, king to f8 and queen to c1. This is the famous Alakine's gun. A lot of power. And now you're going to be asking, yeah, but look, uh, black plays rook b to c8. Let's just count the attackers and defenders. It's something you're going to do very often in your chess career. Pretty much every single game. Every single one. One, two, three, and four, right? And one, two, three, and four. So you would say, yeah, but how do you break through? How do you make in progress here? I mean, what's going to happen? And it's not quite over yet. Look at this positional um, um, moving uh, bishop to a4, which actually clears the way for the pawn to move and uh, for the pawn to advance. And if the knight on c6 moves, guess what? Here you guys looked at the attackers or defenders on the c7. How many white pieces attack c7? One, two, and three. That's exactly how you need to do it. How many black pieces defend? One and two. That means you're going to win. Here we go. So now, out of desperation, b5, really not going to help too much. And bishop takes here. And after this thing happened, you only need to drop the bishop back, push the pawn, and we're going back where we were. Okay, This is just, this is just great. And notice, please, how the black pieces can't really move. 
If the queen goes, they're going to drop the defenses on the c6. So you're going to have three and white's going to have four. So you're going to start losing material. And we all know <clears throat> when you lose material, you're practically very close to losing the game. So that's how important it is. Every single pawn matters and a piece even more. Yes, that's true. There is the other pri principle. Actually, pieces activity matters the most. That is true. But in our position, a very positional, classical, alakine gun, ganging up on their weakness, bring more firepower, and you're going to break it. You're going to do it. You're going to break through the opponent's defenses. Let's have a look at another positioning here. Uh, very, very instructive. Now, you probably notice that black is having two rooks on H, on G, on H, and they're looking like this. The question is, how do you break through? How do you clear the way for the rooks to attack the white king fortress? Well, sometimes uh, we've got something known, uh, called a sacrifice in chess. You're going to sacrifice a pawn or a piece. In our position here, even if white is guarding the G5 square, like how many times? Let's just count them. One, two, three, and four. True. How many times do you attack it with black? One, two, three, four here. Um, you would say, well, why would I why would I actually do this kind of move here? You do a little bit of a pawn sacrifice, you're pushing, taking, taking. Now, obviously, they're attacking three times, they could very nicely take. And of course, you're not gonna take the knight. You're not gonna take the knight because uh the bishop's gonna take, and if you touch it back, the queen will take your stuff back. So you can't really touch this knight. But there is an in-between move. Very important in-between move. There's another concept, ladies and gents. In-between move, intermezzo, or technically in German, Schwitzenzug, if I uh, learned correctly from my uh, friends that speak German. So we've got queen to h5, and that's, that does two very important things. First thing first, you're threatening a checkmate on the back rank, given the fact you do have a deadly battery here. That's not to be trifled with. Very strong, very powerful. Secondly, you are exerting pressure on the g5 white knight. How many times? One, two, three, and one, two. But more importantly, let's go back. You are threatening checkmate in a move, just like that. There is another uh, desperation uh, move here, uh, which could be, for instance, knight to h3. But now, if we understood another principle, a pinned piece, now, you could very nicely envisage now, if queen were to capture the knight, the pawn on g2 cannot take the queen back, because the pawn on g2 is pinned by the rook to the king. Can't take, because the king would be exposed to check. Therefore, you take very confidently, and it's winning. It is winning for black in this position. Shall we try maybe one last exercise, guys? Feel free to revisit the video if needed in the future here. Now, it's pretty much similar to that Alakine Aaron Nimzovich example we took from their game in 1930. Here you have the rook, here you have your rooks attacking, and if you're thinking about, yeah, rook takes, rook takes, and, you know, knight takes or something, nothing's gonna happen really in terms of dominating the C file. Remember, look at your resources, Probably you uh, must have noticed we got a very good bishop here on d3. And this guy is going to do a heck of a job now because they're going to play bishop to a6. What does that do? You're hitting the rook. You're forcing them to either move away, therefore c5 belongs to you, or to trade. But once you do trade, once you do trade, let me just try again. Sorry, guys. Once you do trade, you notice that the rook can't really go on c8. So now let's just take with the queen here on c2. Uh, more powerful here with the queen. I can imagine, I would imagine for white would be an interesting idea to probably play queen to c7. And if queen takes, you've got a rook hitting already two minor pieces at the same time, keeping the rook here pretty much blocked behind the pawn because you're going to take it. So I think it's looking very good. Now mentioning there is also a knight on a3 ready to jump on e5, and that would be absolutely, absolutely glorious. It's looking really, really, really good here now. Good. So let's just pause it here for the time being, uh, ladies and gents. I hope it was useful. Don't forget to subscribe. We're going to be doing more opening, middle game, and endings discussions together. And uh, follow me on Twitch. I'm going to be doing some live stream maybe in half an hour from now on. So check uh, the uh, Twitch, my Twitch channel. We're going to be meeting live. 
and playing friendlies, doing puzzles, discussing and commenting live the Super Gems games. Have a wonderful day. See you soon.